Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. If you're just tuning in on this show, we talk about everything when it comes to crowdfunding, how to launch a new campaign, how to do a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo. We talk about e-commerce. We also talk about some of the marketing tricks and hacks that are working. As well as today, we're actually getting into a really novel marketing platform that I think is going to kind of just blow your socks off with the results that today's guest has gotten which we'll get into in just a second. But you know, if you've never listened to the show, first of all, you got to go and listen to some of the other episodes. I do a YouTube channel. I do the podcast. i got a bunch of books out there on crowdfunding as well as other topics that you can check out on Amazon. And really, this for me has always been a labor of love and to try to share with you actionable, real-world tactics that you can use in order to reach your goals faster, whether you're trying to come up with a new product or you're trying to grow a business or you're just kind of wondering, how does this whole crowdfunding thing work? And that's really why I started the podcast back in 2015. And we've had on hundreds of interviews and guests. And you can go through the archives. This is literally like a treasure trove that you can look at and just pull out all the techniques that are working today when it comes to doing an effective campaign. Now, first of all, the campaign that we're talking about today is Light Pong. And this creator was able to raise, this is a six-figure Kickstarter campaign, right? So they're able to raise over $100,000 for a new game product, a one-dimensional game console that they created. And un interestingly enough, they were able to tap into an entirely new marketing strategy, which a lot of you might be considering in the audience that I think is really going to pay you a lot of dividends. So they're able to track more than 1,000 backers for this, did a super good job. And kind of what I'm talking about here is this whole new platform, which you might know and you may have heard, which is called TikTok, right? TikTok, TikTok, what all the kids are talking about nowadays. So TikTok, this platform is super new, super innovative, and TikTok ads are also a thing, obviously, now. And this creator was able to attract more than 77,000 followers and get more than 1 million likes for their new TikTok account that they just launched specifically for the Kickstarter campaign. Think about that. What if you could have 77,000 people that are following you? And how did this work? Well, they had one, not just one, but multiple videos go viral on the TikTok platform. Now, when I'm talking about viral, I'm not talking about like 2,000 views, man. I'm not talking about like 1,000. I'm talking about 2 million views, 3.7 million views, right? Some of these videos have massive appeal and massive amounts of people that are watching them. And there are multiple on their channel, 6.7 million. This is the one that I'm looking at right now. So this is for Play Light Pong. I think you're gonna hear it, learn a lot about not only how TikTok works, not only how social media can supercharge your campaign and the things that you can go and do leading you into an upcoming Kickstarter launch. So if you wanna get access to some of the cutting edge stuff when it comes to my material, number one, obviously you gotta go and check out the YouTube channel, listen to the podcast, buy my book, The Kickstarter Launch Formula, available on Audible or Amazon. Really great stuff. But if you really want kind of like the more beyond the nuts and bolts and some of the secrets that I share when it comes to crowdfunding, you got to check out the link that I'm about to mention because I'm telling you, this is going to open your eyes to what works well when it comes to crowdfunding. So the link here, you got to write this down. The link that I'm about to mention is crowdcrux.com slash masterclass. Go to that link, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash masterclass, okay? Crowdcrux.com slash masterclass. I'm going to be sharing with you some of the techniques, hacks, resources, tips, tools, things that you can do to really level up your campaign. And I invite you to attend that because I think you're really going to like that. So again, that's crowdcrux.com slash masterclass. And if you'd like to do you know, one-on-one -on -one touch point with me, I will share a way to do that at the end of today's podcast episode. But it's coming up right after this. Let's discover how this creator went viral on TikTok. Are they able to raise over $100,000 on Kickstarter? Coming up right after this. If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight, and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com slash checklist, fulfillright.com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. 
Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Today we have an extremely successful campaign on the show that's attracted more than 1,300 backers, more than six-figure raise for Light Pong, the one-dimensional game console. We have Akib on the line here to share a little bit about the project and also the inspiration behind it. Hey man, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Do you think we get started? Maybe you could just describe for the listeners. I know it's a very visual campaign. Maybe you could just describe to them a bit about the project and what they could expect to see if they check it out. Yeah, you're definitely right about it being a very visual campaign. And it's a type of product where it's very hard to explain to people what it actually is unless they don't see it for themselves. So I'm going to try my best here. But Light Pong is the world's first one-dimensional game console. So gamers can play a lot of different games on a single beam of light. So what that means is that it's a product that's made up of about a five and a half foot long light tube. It's a flexible light tube with an LED light on the inside and multiple buttons on either end. So the most simple game that we play and kind of the, the original game that we started off with was uh, ping pong. And uh, users just have to hit the ball across the light um, as they're playing against each other. And the first one to miss gets gets out essentially. Another one of these games is uh, Tug of War, for example, where you, the faster you smash the button, the more of the tube you can take over and the person who takes over the entire tube essentially wins. Got it. Very cool. When you launched this campaign, was this your first product that you've come out with or have you been making products before? First consumer product. I mean, we've done a lot of products before this for other businesses. So I had a B2B company, which is where Lightpong evolved out of. And I essentially, when the pandemic hit, that business essentially shut down. And I was like, well, what are we going to do? And uh, that's when we're like, let's focus on Lightpong. This is a project that's been on the shelf for a couple of years. Let's make it happen. And for your role in the project, are you a marketer? Are you a designer? Are you an engineer? How would you describe yourself? I'm primarily a marketer, but I consider myself a very technical marketer from the perspective of I used to be a product manager in my previous life. So product managing very, very technical and complex products, digital products. So as far as Lightpong is concerned, I'm definitely more of a marketer. And I've got a fantastic team of uh, technical people working with me on this. How, and how did the idea come about? Uh, the idea was created by one of my friends acquaintance actually so i saw it at a party for the first time and i was like this is an awesome concept and it took me a couple of years but i ended up acquiring it um and decided to take it to market on my own very cool very cool man so tell me about the kickstarter campaign because this is a different way of bringing the product to market what made you decide to go down this validation of early demand i I think that kickstarter is a phenomenal place to actually show people your product and your idea and honestly even show yourself what the full potential of the idea is right and that early validation was key like we wanted to make sure like is this something people actually want or do they just say that they want it is this something worth investing our time into and is 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 the community going to come together and help us fund this project or no so it's a very early kind of beta alpha test to put the entire idea out and see how the market responds to it. And had you ever done a Kickstarter campaign before this? I had not. And, you know, I kind of wish I had, to be honest. There's so much that you learn along the way. And there's a lot of uh, circumstances. I'm like, damn, I wish I'd done this once before so I would have gotten it. And that's actually one of my pieces of advice for people who've never done this before and are planning to do it is just do one on your own. Don't make the mistake I did. Just do one all the way, no matter how small it is, it doesn't matter. Even if it has like five backers on it and it's a really like simple, goofy project that you started, just test the platform out. I think that's important to, to do at least once. How how long did it take you to get together this project? Well, uh, conceptually, we started working on this like last November. We're like, hey, let's put the engineering pieces of it together. And then once we had an early engineering validation, I'd say at that point, we started working on the project full time, quote unquote. And so that's basically as of last February to September. So it's taken almost eight months. And I'm sure you went through a bunch of different iterations leading up to the launch here. What did it feel like? You know, you spent so much time on this and you had an idea and you witnessed it. You know, you acquired the IP. 
What did it feel like before you went live with this project? Oh, it's extremely nerve wracking. I'm the type of person where like, I, I consider myself to handle stress very, very well and effectively, but it's different. It's different types of stress, mostly because uh, I guess a lot of the projects that I've handled in the past, there is time to iterate. So even if it's an initial failure, you have time to make it successful. But with the Kickstarter campaign, you only have 30 days to make it successful, right? So the pressure is slightly different, like it's now or never type of pressure. And that sort of pressure is significant. And how is that different, would you say? Like, did it make you think of new ways of marketing it? Or did it go into, you know, you need to make sure that you make get the most bang for your buck and really, you know, push when it comes to credibility and PR? Like, how did that change, would you say? I explored quite a lot of different avenues before I actually decided to go with the channels that I did, right? So PR was certainly one of those avenues that I considered. And uh, I, I mean, I guess right now we've been featured by Mashable and Gizmodo and Hackster and a couple of other smaller publications as well. PR was definitely not a strategy that I was uh, actively pursuing by any means. The one that I was actually actively pursuing, which honestly has failed me, was pure performance marketing, digital ads, like basically ROAS. And for those of you who aren't familiar, that's return on ad spend. You put in a dollar, you can make up to two, three, four, five, six dollars. So that was the one that I was banking on the most, but actually it failed me uh, quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> and the one that worked really, really, really well was uh, just pre-launch marketing, getting people to a landing page using Facebook or Instagram, getting them to put their email address, getting them to fill out a form, getting them to then maybe pay a dollar to reserve. Like That's the one that worked solid for us because we were able to get the lowest cost per lead as far as that piece of it was concerned. So you're you're going over a lot of a lot of territory here just to kind of slow down when it comes to this this pre-launch that you were mentioning. So you were doing this in order to do accomplish what? In order to get an email list of people that are definitely interested in the product and are willing to are interested in purchasing once we launch. And okay. based on we were working with an advertising agency out of New uh, out of Manchester, UK called Nuke Digital, and they had set up a campaign for us where, essentially, a potential customer sees our ad on Facebook or on Instagram. This is a video ad because that worked really well for us, and then they're like, "Hey, uh, learn more." So when they click learn more, they're then taken to a landing page. On that landing page, of course, they get more information. They kind of get a sense for what the price is going to be, and they're prompted to provide their name and their email. That's the only purpose of that page. They then receive our emails on a fairly consistent basis. At some point in that email funnel, they get the opportunity to reserve in advance. And the, they, they pay a dollar now to get the lowest possible price once the launch happens. So we're kind of doing that to, to get a sense for how many people are actually going to put money down once this project goes live, you know? Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. Were you doing mainly um, like Instagram, Facebook? Did you try anything on TikTok at all or any other platforms? So we did really, really well on TikTok organically. So we have about 70 to 75,000 people on TikTok right now that follow us. We've got uh, approximately 25 million views across our TikTok and Instagram reels. So organically, we did phenomenal. However, on the ad side of things, on TikTok, we didn't do really well. Like, I, It could be because I'm not saying that the TikTok platform is bad. It could be that I didn't have anyone who specialized in TikTok advertising focusing on it. It was just me kind of playing around and trying to figure out how to make it happen. So it was unsuccessful. Decided to put all of my basket of eggs in the Facebook Instagram basket. Got it. When it came to TikTok, like, how did you get all of those followers? Was it just putting out content or was it hashtags? Just putting out content. And this is actually another funny story. Well, so, you know, it, it, the the format is, we, we like to, pro, we pride ourselves in journaling on thinking very methodically and very scientifically on all this. So we're thinking, well, let's treat this entire thing as a very scientific experiment and let's see what's working best, right? So we basically list out every single different feature that we can possibly test. So that includes hashtags, like you mentioned, but that also includes like animations and that includes GIFs and that includes sounds and that includes includes trending sounds, right? So we put together this 60-day testing plan. And our idea was like, hey, let's just tweak one small thing every day and see, measure these results and see what's happening uh, the best for us. 
So we, we, we started off on this like 60 day adventure. And honestly, by day three, we were viral. By the third day, we already had hit like almost 1 million views on one of our uh, videos. And it kind of ruined our experiment quite significantly because we had no idea what was that one thing that get, got us to hit, you know, if it had, ha- yeah. <laughs> if it had happened in, in our method, we were being able to track like, oh, this is what got us to be there. But because we went viral on day three, we're like, okay, well, I'm super confused now. So it took us almost a week to two weeks to reverse engineer what we had done. And I'm happy to share what we had done too. Yeah, I mean, that sounds super interesting. Well, the first question I was going to also ask you was, you, you're basically going instantly viral. You're getting tons of people commenting and liking, I'm sure. What did that feel like when you hit that moment and you start to resonate with the community? Really good, really, really good. I mean, it, it was almost shocking. We're like, we, we were in the office and when one of our videos started to go viral, we're like, okay, well, hey, this thing just hit a thousand views. This thing just hit 10,000 views. This thing just hit like 200,000 views. And we're like, wait, what is going on? This makes no sense. This doesn't fall in line with any of our experiments. And we have no idea what's going on. But it was awesome. I mean, really, really good. And uh, like, I guess the other caveat that I'll add here is that we almost went viral too early. I wish we had gone uh, to, to some extent. I wish we just pushed off our social media marketing efforts to maybe like a week or two weeks before the Kickstarter launch so that when we went viral, people would be able to buy immediately or like at least pledge immediately because I'm sure there's been a significant amount of drop-off between that time and between when we launched. But I mean, these are things that you can't predict. You just go, you know. Yeah, and just to be specific here, when you say go viral, you're referring to the video you got with like 3.7 million views, right? Correct. So that is just one of the videos that went viral. But I mean, like I said, across all of our platforms, it's uh, all of our videos on TikTok and Instagram, we're about 25 million views right now. Yeah, that's insane, man. That's that's so much attention and just so many people around the world checking yeah. that out. And funny story, it's like I, there's been multiple instances. Well, one, I was at a wedding with my, it was like a plus one. And as I'm sitting at the table, I don't know anybody there. I'm just telling them what I do. And they're like, oh, I've seen you on TikTok. I know exactly what this is. And I'm like, oh, no way. That's crazy. You know, <laughs> and similar instance with like people that we're hiring, right? People that we're hiring are telling us like, oh, I, I'm, this is so weird. I saw you guys on TikTok and then I saw your thing on LinkedIn. But this sounds cool. You know, so it's been a weird effect. 25 million is, is a lot of people. It's a lot and lot and lot of people, you know, so it's hard to even for us as human beings, as animals to like think at that scale. It's kind of hard to, to wrap our brains around it. And you're obviously a seasoned marketer, right? You know your space, you know digital marketing pretty well. When it comes to TikTok, I think the big thing is also figuring out, are these people buyers? Like, I think that's the big thing in, in the digital marketing space is trying to assess TikTok in general. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Are these people converting? Are they just teenagers online? Like, what are your thoughts on that audience? Uh, That's a really, really good question. So let me put it in perspective, right? So if we have 70,000 followers on TikTok, we believe that only about maybe 10% of them are actually on our email list because TikTok just makes it easy for you to follow. But what we've noticed is that on Instagram, we have much, much more loyal followers, right? Let me, let, me, let me give you another example. When we go live on Instagram Live, we get instantly 20 to 25 people watching us the whole way and are engaging and interacting, right? When we go live on TikTok, we get maybe uh, like seven to 800 people join in for one to two seconds and then bounce. So we found that TikTok largely tends to be more like whatever, just follow this thing, move on. Whereas Instagram tends to be like people who actually care and are interested in potentially being buyers. So we don't necessarily consider the TikTok people to be buyers. It is just great for exposure bucks and frankly, for me to be able to talk about it in this format (laughs) and with other people, you know. Do do you think there's anything there in terms of the medium? So like maybe TikTok is more of like a text message marketing environment versus like an email marketing environment. What do you think of that? TikTok being more text message marketing? I feel like text message marketing converts higher than TikTok does. Using your TikTok following and pushing them to like an SMS list versus an email list. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I see. That's a good point. I mean, I haven't tried that. I, I would say that it's hard to because at the end of the day, like, 
if someone's interested on TikTok or they're int- they're, they're just going to click the link in bio because we do promote the link in bio quite significantly. And what we found is that most people leave our TikTok who like actually like our stuff and then go to Instagram and the email list both. So there's been several instances where people are on our Instagram live or on Instagram in general have said, oh, I found you guys on TikTok, you know, but now I just wanted to have a, a longer, I wanted to actually follow you, not just like TikTok follow you. <laughs> Interesting. So it's almost like it, the TikTok is building awareness and creating curiosity which then gets them to a place where you could do a transaction in the future absolutely absolutely but you do need to 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 get them off of tiktok in order to successfully execute yeah Um, that's super interesting super interesting like i i I, someone was telling me about their story i can't remember who it was but they said that they went viral on tiktok they actually went viral bigger than us on tiktok but they didn't add any sort of link in bio or conversion you know, a page or landing page to collect people's email addresses. And they ended up losing out on a lot, a lot of people because of that. Jeez. Yeah. So obviously the lesson learned there is to always have some kind of a way in which people can, you can get their contact info. I think the other one that you mentioned is just putting out a lot of good content, right? Like putting out a lot of quality content helps in general with any platform i think you're on yeah absolutely and for us the you know the kind of remember earlier in this conversation i mentioned how we had spent time to reverse engineer what made us go be successful in the beginning it it was in large part like through a lot of different experiments after that we figured that actually through a couple of different um things that we did we essentially started to think about how the algorithm works on TikTok, right? And of course, TikTok hasn't publicly talked about how their algorithm works, but our assumption and what we've kind of figured out is working for us is uh, two things. One, we kind of treat the TikTok algorithm, we, we, for us, we're creating for the TikTok algorithm. We're not really creating for people. We just feel like if we create for the TikTok algorithm and are basically creating content for that algorithm, then the algorithm is going to figure out how to get to these people. So part of what we're doing is we're saying, well, TikTok is probably doing some sort of audio recognition, some sort of video recognition, and is understanding what images we're showing in the video content. They're also listening to what words we're using to talk about in this video content. They're probably also uh, matching up the hashtags with it and the descriptions with it and kind of trying to see who this content is for. And basically, it's making some sort of assumption like, oh, you know, you're talking about brain fitness in the audio. You've said the word brain fitness in your description. You've hashtag brain fitness and there's a brain in your video. So let's try to put this to people who might be interested in brain fitness gains. Mm, And right. And based on that, we're creating for this algorithm but doing everything to maximize simplicity, almost like you're you're like making for a three-year-old. And if the three-year-old understands that this is a brain fitness video, it's going to show it to other people, brain fitness people in the room or in the area, right? That's exactly how we're treating it. So based on that is, is how we're going viral multiple times over. Yeah, I can imagine also there must be something with audience retention, like how long people are watching the videos, Absolutely. the same way with YouTube, right? Absolutely. And one of the the exercises that I like is like going to the ads platform and see what um, the ads platform is letting you do. And of course, watch time is one of them. Behavior is one of them. Likes is one of them. Like you can filter through that extent. Right. And because you can tell that on the ads platform, this is how they're tracking people. This is we know what our end goal is and what our end result is and how we need to be what we need to be optimizing for. So putting those two things together is key. Mm -hmm. Did you have any success with using TikTok ads at all? That's kind of like a a new terrain for a lot of people. Yes and no. So this is, I had a weird experience with TikTok ads. When I first started creating TikTok ads, my cost per lead was phenomenal, right? And this was without any optimization with basically using you know, smart optimization that TikTok offers where they will take multiples of your videos, multiples of your captions, multiples of your, like all these different setups that you can do. And they will automatically create multiple different ads using combinations of whatever you put in. And when I did that, it worked really, 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 really well. Like my cost per lead was essentially 97 cents and my max target was $1.50. And as I started to put in more optimizations into it, 
Mike Osprey <laughs> kept going up. Weird, and weird. I know. I was like, I'm optimizing for your system. And as soon as I'm doing that, my gospel lead is going up. So um I I it it was great initially, but then as I started to do more optimizations, it started to get worse. And the more work we put into making it better, the worse it got. So finally we're like, we're not sure what the hell's going on over here. Let's just stop. Our hunch is that we probably needed to continue to recycle the content because TikTok audience gets bored really quick so that's probably our initial hunch but we don't know for a fact that's why we stopped doing it okay okay it makes a lot of sense well first of all i mean you know you've had a, a great success here in You've been able to obviously get the attention of people out there and you for a long time were creating this product and now it's out there. You know, people can look at it on TikTok and you have like that mini kind of celebrity effect. So congratulations on that. The the second question I had for you, just kind of following up, was, you know, as it comes to this project, what do you feel like for you has been the most rewarding part of this? Because you're a marketer, right? And you've obviously discovered a lot of what works and what doesn't. Is it that? Is it the physical product that now is in reality? Like what part of this process do you enjoy the most? I, I consider myself to be, you know, creator. To me, what I really, really, really enjoy, and this is my passion in life, right? Is you're having a discussion with someone in your home while playing a video game and some, you know, you're just hanging out with your friends and some someone's just, oh, wouldn't it be cool if someone did this? And turning that idea that just came up in conversation and then making it a reality, like that's what I love in this life, right? Because now about eight to nine months later, the person that you had that discussion with is like, wait, what? Like, this is mind blowing. You've actually turned that one side conversation that we had into a product and people are actually touching and playing with it. Like that is insane. To me, that's the most rewarding part of this whole thing. It's the opportunity to be able to just say, I, we were talking about this, thought it was a good idea, brought it to life, here it is, put it in people's hands, boom, done. So it's an opportunity. It's a privilege. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's almost like yes. a superpower. When did you first realize that you liked it? You know, I, I've been in the creative space for many, many years, right? When I was a young kid, when I was 13, 14, I had a podcast. I used to DJ. I used to do a lot of video type of stuff. And after that, I went to film school. I went to film school here in Chicago. I created a bunch of films and stuff. Then after that, I was in like technology for a little bit, did startup product management, built a team and took it from like three people to 15 people. So there was a lot of building going on. After that, I started like a meetup group called the Midwest Immersive Tech Meetup where we did VR and AR. So all things considered for me, I didn't know that that's what I was passionate about. I just knew that I was interested in creating and my interest in creating stuff always changed, which initially I thought was a problem. I was like, I keep switching areas and my interest keeps switching and I keep trying different things. But now I think that that's a superpower to be able to switch industries and go into a completely new area and take all the information that you learned from the previous industry and apply it to this new one while also learning new skills, right? So we had many, many years to realize that that's what I enjoyed the most. And I was started to become more forgiving on myself to say, okay, well, you don't like film anymore. That's fine. You still like the idea of building. Let's go and build something else with other people. And a lot of what I chase too is like people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's super interesting as well because you've combined a lot of those pursuits in terms of film, community building, creating something new. You've done that all with the Kickstarter as well. So you've right. drawn on a lot of these skills. Right, right, exactly. So, I mean, you know, no, uh, I don't know if you follow Jack Ma from Alibaba. A lot of people don't like him. But there is <laughs> uh, one anecdote from uh, from one of his speeches that I really liked. And he says that, you know, between 20 to 30 years old, just try everything that you possibly can. It doesn't matter if you fall. It doesn't matter if you're successful. What matters is that you tried and you got the experience and now you understand how to make it work for the next time, right? So to me, I'm almost 30 years old. Hell, I'm going to be up uh, 20... I'm going to be 30 years old in two days. So I would say that my 20s, 30s was just like experimentation. Let's just fail. Let's just figure it out. Let's just see what happens and just try a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think that's so important and it gives you a lot of experience, obviously, and it's allowed you to stumble on a success and, you know, everything that you're doing now is also drawing on those other skills. So super important. 
I just have like one or two more questions for you. So, you know, when it comes to the Kickstarter campaign, are there any bits of advice, you know, maybe one or two big nuggets that you would pass on to someone who's just kind of a beginner in the audience that might be interested in doing one of these projects? Yeah, I would say, you know, and, you know, I also consider myself to be a beginner in this space myself, right? And the one thing that I learned from this campaign quite a bit was double down on what's working quick. You know, earlier on this conversation, I'd mentioned how our pre-launch marketing efforts were going phenomenally well. At that time, I saw that it was going well, and I noticed, like, oh, this is going super well. And what I should have done right at that point was double down on that effort right then and there. But I thought, oh, there's more stuff to go. There's other efforts that we need to pull off. But I didn't realize that, I guess in my mind, it was like this next thing is also going to be just as successful. So who cares? But now, in hindsight, I'm like, well, that one thing was working so well. And now the opportunity to capitalize on that as best as I possibly can is gone. It's a loss forever. So my advice is if you notice something that's working really, really well, don't worry about the future. Just double down right then and there. Go for it. Got it. So basically, if something's working well, you know, run with it. Keep plowing more fuel into that thing because you never know if it's going to stop working in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have another piece of advice that, uh, for people as well. And this is something that, again, I, I realized like a, probably a couple of days after I started my Kickstarter campaign, which was try to get like, you know, at, when, when we're, we're launching our pages, we're showing it off to people who are also familiar with our project to some extent. Almost everybody that I got feedback from had an understanding of what my damn project was. And everybody had a different uh, feedback. Oh, you should do this and you should do this and you should do that. Great. But when I actually launched, everybody who was looking at my page was people that didn't know me, didn't know about the project and just needed information right so you almost need to think about this in user testing way like put it in front of 10 people who are familiar with kickstarter but are not familiar with your page and try to get their feedback and critique almost like you would test an app while you're building it you know try them to navigate around it tell them to like click a couple of buttons, tell them, ask them questions about what information they got, you know? So people who are potentially interested in your product, but have never uh, actually like interacted with you, that's key. That information is very, very necessary. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I think that also um, just from a digital marketing background, I think you drew a lot from that and just being aware of someone's mindset, right? Which is so important. Awesome, man. So first of all, where can people go and learn a little bit more about your project and also this business, which you're, which you're growing? So uh, our website is uh, playlikepong.com. We are on Instagram. Everywhere we go, everywhere you go, our, our, our handles are all playlikepong. But we are still on Kickstarter, and our Kickstarter is going to be done in approximately 10 days. So if you're listening, the best place is to go on kickstarter.com, look up Light Space Pong, and you'll find us there. Very cool. And my final question for you is, if you could share a, a word of encouragement for someone in the audience or a final tip, what would that be? And you can kind of speak directly to the audience there. People have no fear. Just do it. Don't worry about it. Whether you fail, whether you don't fail, whether you win, it, it, the experience is going to make a lot, a lot of difference to you. So I would highly recommend just make it happen, man. Just make it happen. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and good luck with your remaining days here with your campaign. I appreciate this. Thank you very, very much. Hey, thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Rigan. I really appreciate your time, man. I appreciate it so much. And that's really why when putting together these episodes, I always keep in mind to have on interesting creators because I want this to be worth your time. I know that your time is valuable and every single week that you spend with me is spent trying to level up exactly what it is that you're doing. So I put a lot of thought into this and it means so much to me if you could take a second to number one, rate and review this podcast on iTunes. If you're listening to this on Spotify, you can also do the same thing. If you're listening on YouTube, leave a comment or give me a thumbs up to let me know that you enjoyed this episode. It does mean a lot and I appreciate it and other people see that and they know that it's worth their time as well. We're trying to create a culture here where we're sharing transparently what is working well and really pulling back the hood or demystifying this entire marketing process, which I think is way more complicated than it needs to be. And that's been like a hallmark in my life, honestly, is like people always try to make things more complicated than they need to be. 
be, whether that's doing something related to marketing or in other areas of my life. When I was first starting my blog back in 2012 for Crowd Crux, things were just so complicated. When I started my podcast, so complicated. So I've written books over time just to kind of help explain and demystify different elements of the process, whether that's equity crowdfunding, real estate crowdfunding, nonprofit fundraising, Kickstarter. I really tried to share that with people because I think that you owe it. You owe it to be explained to in the most easy to understand, simple way, high level, but also effective. You know, this isn't something that we have to use big terms and throw around all that jargon in order to sound intelligent, in order to sound smart. I'd rather just tell you how it is, man. We don't have to dress it all up with fluff and dress it all up with these fancy words. I just got to show you exactly what is working. So first of all, if that's something that you're interested in, if you like my no-nonsense explanation style, the way that I like to teach and bring a little bit of pizzazz as well to it and some of my passion to my work, go and check out the masterclass when it comes to crowdfunding, which will show you exactly how to smash your goal on Kickstarter. So if you're interested in that, go and check this out. This link, crowdcrux.com slash masterclass. Again, that link is crowdcrux.com slash masterclass. In addition, if you'd like to get in touch with me personally, now my schedule is filling up a lot. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's filling up a lot, man. But if you do want to still get in while I'm doing these individual coaching calls, you can go to the link that I'm about to mention. I do close them every once in a while just because I get overwhelmed. So if you go to that link and it's just not available, I apologize. It's probably just because I've had too many calls recently and it's just filling up. So you want to make sure that you do that quickly if you are interested in locking in my time. So that link is crowdc crux.com slash coaching. That link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching, crowdcrux.com slash coaching. With that link, you'll be able to see a little bit more about number one, what you got to do going into a campaign. We'll talk individually about your specific category, fill out some information there with your form. So I know exactly what it is that you're doing. I can get a better sense of it. And you can also tailor the conversation a little bit more to you so you can have actionable points to take away and really make the most use of your time. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Sal and I will see you next time.